You are paged to the A&E department where you meet Chris, a 36-year-old male who was involved in a road traffic accident. Chris's car was stationary at the time of impact when another vehicle collided into the side of him. The paramedics who arrived on the scene noted that Chris complained of head, neck and back pain. A range of scans and tests are ordered and you notice that Chris appears to have an elevated right hemidiaphragm on his chest radiograph. My name's Connor and today I'm providing the voiceover for this presentation made by John. In the next five minutes, we're going to cover the anatomy of the cervical plexus and the cervical spine. We'll also explore how it correlates with the elevated hemidiaphragm seen in Chris. Here are a few of the sources we've used for this video. Before we begin, we've previously made a tutorial that you should check out first. It covers the basic features of the cervical vertebrae and the unique qualities of the two uppermost vertebrae, the atlas and axis. Firstly, here's a diagram of the C1 to C7 vertebra arranged as they sit in the body. To orient ourselves, recall that each vertebra possesses a vertebral body anteriorly, a spinous process posteriorly, which in cervical vertebra is bifid, a transverse process, which encloses the transverse foramen. A key structure running inside the transverse foramen is the vertebral artery, which will produce the basilar artery in the neurocranium. To articulate with one another, the vertebrae have two superior and two inferior articular processes. There is a fibrocartilaginous body known as the intervertebral disc between each vertebral body. These act to hold the vertebrae together, but more importantly function as shock absorbers. A similar structure is seen between the articular processes, known as the zygopophysial joints or facet joints. These glide and limit the range of cervical spine movement, hence protecting it against excessive rotation and flexion. An important cavity lies between each vertebra, known as the intervertebral foramen. It's important because these foramen are the entry and exit points of the spinal nerves. In the cervical region, there are eight spinal nerves the first of which exits superior to the C1 vertebra, whereas the rest exit inferior to their respective vertebra. There is a repeating ligament between each spinous process, known as the interspinous ligament. This acts to resist hyperflexion of the neck whilst restricting separation of the spinous processes. Moving posteriorly, there is a ligament known as the nuchal ligament, which acts as an insertion site for various muscles of the neck. The nuchal ligament is continuous with the supraspinous ligament inferiorly. Anteriorly, there is a thick band known as the anterior longitudinal ligament. This ligament resists hyperextension of the neck. This is an anterior view of the cervical vertebra. Here is the dens, a unique bony structure of the axis. Similarly, to orient ourselves, here is the vertebral body. The intervertebral discs and the transverse processes, which house the vertebral artery in their transverse foramen. The spinal nerves, which exit via the intervertebral foramen and the anterior longitudinal ligament. The spinal nerves loop together distally to form the cervical plexus. The cervical plexus is formed by the spinal nerve roots of C1 to C4. The ventral ramus of C1 gives off a branch which accompanies the hypoglossal nerve, also known as cranial nerve 12. The hypoglossal nerve innervates some of the extrinsic muscles of the tongue, namely the styloglossus, hyoglossus and genioglossus, as well as the intrinsic muscles of the tongue. The C1 branch itself innervates the geniohyoid muscle, which is a suprahyoid muscle, and the thyrohyoid muscle, which is an infrahyoid muscle. The C1 nerve fibres then intermingle with C2 and C3 to form a loop known as the ansa cervicalis. Ansa is Latin for handle, and cervicalis denotes of the neck. C1 forms the superior root, whilst C2 and C3 fuse to form the inferior root. This loop innervates four infrahyoid muscles, which are the superior belly of the omohyoid, sternohyoid, sternothyroid, and finally the inferior belly of the omohyoid. A crucial structure of the cervical plexus is the phrenic nerve, formed from the roots C3, C4 and C5. These act to innervate the diaphragm, hence any damage can impair respiration. A useful way to remember the nerve roots innervating the diaphragm is C3, 4 and 5 keep the diaphragm alive. The cervical plexus lies anterior medial to two muscles of the neck, the levator scapulae and the middle scalene, which also lies deep to the sternocleidomastoid. Now we've seen the gross anatomy of the cervical vertebra and the cervical plexus, let's return to Chris. Due to the damage Chris has suffered to the phrenic nerve, his chest radiograph will show paradoxical movement of the diaphragm. During normal inspiration, the diaphragm will contract bilaterally in an inferior direction to increase the thoracic volume and hence decrease pressure to allow air to fill the lungs. In paradoxical movement of the diaphragm, Unilateral paralysis will mean the functioning side of the diaphragm contracts downwards normally, whereas the paralysed side will move upwards during inspiration 
due to increased pressure in the abdominal cavity. And there we go. That's the cervical plexus and cervical vertebra covered in five minutes. If you liked today's tutorial, remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel and leave a comment down below with what you'd like to see next.